and welcome back to my channel. Bonsoir et bienvenue sur ma chaîne. My name is Muriel and this evening I'm going to do a review of Unquenchable Fire by Rachel Pollock. I wasn't originally sure if I was going to do a review for this novel but it's so strange and unique. I have so many thoughts about it that I I just need to get them out there. So Unquenchable Fire was published in 1988 and won the 1989 Arthur C. Clarke award. It's, as you can see, published in the Science Fiction Masterworks collection, but it's more a work of fantasy, I guess. This book is truly original. I've honestly genuinely never read anything quite like it. The basic premise is that 90 years prior to the events of the novel, the spiritual world made itself manifest to humanity, so it's referenced as the living world in the novel, and a series of people called the Founders came forward and started sharing incredible stories, parables if you will, or living myths, and they experienced miracles, and a series of fantastic events happened, which proved that spirits are real, God through these spirits is real, all of that spiritual dimension is real, and society had to reorganize itself around that. I mean, I say society, I'm pretty sure this applies to the entire world to some extent, but the focus of the story is in the United States, and the United States has become theocratic in a way, but not in the ways most people would imagine with like Abrahamic religions. Here, religion is institutionalized, but the religion itself is more akin to something like Shintoism, or I don't know, a modernized version of animism. And so, yeah, the, the society is modern, it has developed technology and all those things, but everyday life is just riddled with all these rituals and these customs you have to perform to pay tribute to, well, these founders and the spirits of the living world. And I've just never come across a setting quite like that before. It's very different. It's very weird. I mean, it gets really weird. And so that's the setting, and the story follows one main character called Jennifer Masden, and Jennifer Masden, well, becomes pregnant after having an oracular dream. Or, I mean, is it really a dream? I'd say it's a kind of shamanic journeying more than a dream, but okay, fine. She falls asleep, and then she wakes up, and a few weeks later, she discovers she's pregnant. A miracle, but she's not too happy about that. And so she's trying to make sense of what's happening to her and how her body is being used kind of against her will by this living world of the spirits. So yeah, a very strange premise. And like I said, it's more fantastical than science fiction-y. So I mean, sure, advanced robotics are mentioned in passing fairly quickly. So it's nothing particularly advanced. It's just, well, imagine the world of, well, 30 years ago, or the world of now. Then you have all these spirits and miracles. There, there isn't any magic as such. I mean, there's spiritual occurrences, but it's not referred to as magic. There's no magic system. So yeah, I guess it, it is technically fantasy, but even then it's a very niche kind of spiritual, urban light fantasy. The only thing that comes even close to this in my mind in tone or vibe would perhaps be Kraken by China Mieville. But even then, the fantastical is hidden from most of society. Here, the fantastical is recognized as being real by everyone. And I also add quickly, at times it also almost felt just a tad bit dystopian. It's not a dystopian novel as such, but since everyone has to follow these rituals every day for everything, and I'll get back to that in the world building section, but really everything, it feels complete compulsory and perhaps devoid of the meaning it originally had actually but i'll get to that in themes so this there was something a little oppressive to it i felt it's not dystopian but just oh, something robbed me the wrong way about it I'm like i'm not even i'm not an atheist i'm definitely a secularist though and the spiritual system in there is definitely closer to what i personally believe as an individual than anything like christianity islam or judaism but still it was a bit overkill in that respect so yeah there's a lot going on in there. I don't have anything special to say about the writing. It was fine. It's a service story, just fine. So 
Well, before putting that aside, I will also point out that in addition to the fairly straightforward linear narrative you have in the novel, except for like that very first chapter, which kind of serves as an info dump to present the world to you. So other readers have said this on Goodreads and Rachel on the channel, Kalanadi stated this in her review of Uncrunchable Fire as well. The first 50 pages are a bit slow to get through. So you really have to push past them to get to the actual main storyline with the main character, Jennifer Maston. But in addition to that main story, you have interspersed here and there throughout the book, these excerpts from the tales of the founders. So these founders being kind of like prophets, if you will. And they're like myths or parables. And they're fairly opaque overall. Unless if you're familiar with mythology, as I am, I detected a lot of influences from different myths, which I'll get back to in the world building section. So that was neat. I was like, oh yeah, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. But they're kind of their own thing. They kind of serve to show you the internal coherence of the world Rachel Pollock created. But as to the meaning of each of these myths, that's just another story. Sometimes I just didn't really get what the point of them were outside of the fact of, you know, reinforcing that general world building. Maybe there is an internal meaning to them you're supposed to glean, maybe not. It's hard to tell, but so those are in there as well. Now when it comes to the characters, this is a singular character-focused story. The main character, like I said, is a woman named Jennifer Maslin. She's, what, 28 in the book, I think, my age, something like that. She's an interesting character, well-developed, though at times I will admit I had a hard time really pinpointing who she was as a person. She seems very lost and confused for a big part of the novel. She also seems like someone who lost her faith because it's stated that as a young girl, she really devoured this future society's version of the Bible in a way, which is called The Lives of the Founders. And this is something she shared with her father. But then when you meet her in the novel, she's been, well, not divorced, but basically her husband annulled their marriage. She's living alone in this suburban hive, very tightly knit community. And she feels like a lot of the rituals, which are part of the everyday life of the society, are devoid of their meaning. That the spiritual revolution that happened 90 years ago has, well, lost its steam. And now it's all basically window dressing. And a lot of this stuff just doesn't mean much anymore, even though there are still like benevolent and malevolent spirits doing stuff to people. And she gets pregnant from a dream. So she's really trying to make sense of all that. And I could really relate to her sense of fatalism and depression almost. I mean, she considers suicide at some point. So yeah, I could relate to that. I'm just trying to make sense of shit. But at the same time, the whole motherhood subplot just left me neutral. But those are motherhood storylines in general. I just really do not relate to that. So, you know, whatever. Otherwise, yeah, I wasn't, oh yeah, like I said, I wasn't sure who she was most of the time. So there is good character development, but at the same time I felt like there was perhaps something missing just slightly. But that also might be because the plot overall is fairly sparse and slow going. Not much happens in the story. To me it's more about the world building and the themes, after thinking about it for a while, which I'll get to in a second, than the plot or the characters. So the world building is just very interesting and bizarre. Like I said, I've never come across anything quite like this. So you have this world, or this version of the United States more specifically, like I said, it's not really entirely clear if the rest of the world functions on the same system. I think it does, but at least the United States, right? So the United States, in theory at least, is a secular state with separation of church and state, like in most Western democratic countries at least. And here this is gone. But instead of having like a theocracy a la Handmaid's Tale or the Islamic State of Iran, it's like if um, a neo-pagan version of animism or something akin to perhaps Shintoism became the state religion. But it's also real. It's proven to be real. So this is a world that would drive an atheist nuts. Because atheism itself couldn't even exist in such a world because you have proof that the spiritual exists. I mean, you, I guess you could make a case that, well, it doesn't necessarily prove that God as a creative force exists as such. But come on, <laughs> the spiritual exists. The land of the dead is a real thing, I guess. God is mentioned, but 
I feel like the god they're talking about is more akin to something that I would relate more to in pantheism, for example. God is just the, the spiritual energy that pervades the physical world, something like that. But so I mentioned Shintoism and animism because everything has its garden spirit. And there are deities mentioned, but I guess they're more like avatars of the general divine force that permeates the universe. And they serve as like archetypes for the parables told by the founders and the tellers. So this world has tellers and tellers are basically the inheritors of the founders. And they serve like prophets, sacred storytellers. I mean, that's also an aspect of the shaman, if you will. But they also have like um, oracles people who tell the future with like stones. Now the author apparently is an expert in tarot, so I assume she really knows the stuff when it comes to spiritualism and things like that. And there are lots of mythological references in these different parables. Like I saw a reference to the myth of Isis and Osiris, the descent of Ishtar to the underworld, the myth of Demeter and Persephone, the division of the world between the three main Greek gods, Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon, except here it's like the sky, the earth, and the underworlds. And even that tripartite organization of the world is just foundational to most world mythologies. So that was fun. That was definitely fun. But what's unsettling is that these myths are then interspersed with elements of modern life. You've got these archetypal images mixed with cars and military weaponry and computers and things happening in the here and now with buildings and metropolises and it's it's unsettling because you associate that kind of stuff with like heroic fantasy set in medieval Europe-like settings or medieval Asian-like settings or nowadays which is a good thing any kind of older civilization in the Americas and Africa and Asia what have you. Here it's all in the modern world. So like I said, it's an atheist's nightmare, I guess, because you, you cannot deny that God is real. At best, you can be a secularist. And basically, this world's equivalent of atheists and amoral people, or at least the way atheists sometimes get judged by religious people. And here, it would happen to what are called secularists. And secularists are basically a remain of a bygone age where they don't want to have to ritualize and spiritualize every single aspect of everyday life, and that's frowned upon by most society. And I mean everything. Like I said, everything has its garden spirit. Every occasion has its ritual, which are called enactments. If you're on an abortion, you can have an enactment. If you have a pregnancy, you can have an enactment. If you change jobs, if you get a promotion, if you get a good grade at school, to have your lawn grow appropriately when you move into a new house if you want to go on vacation everything is ritualized and the weird thing is everything gets explained through a spiritual lens but at the same time science is accepted so they mention like what do you think makes atoms stick together so presumably they have modern physics but instead of using words like gravity they'll use spiritual energy it's so weird so it makes it unique, but at the same time, like, I wouldn't want to live in a world like that. It's it's overkill, and that's where I got my quasi-dystopian vibe from. It's not dystopian as such, but, like, you don't even really have a choice but to live like that. I mean, I guess you could be a secularist, but you'd be shunned by most of society. And in any case, you can't really deny that the spiritual is real, because you can be possessed by malignant ones or blessed by benign ones. And if you go to the doctor's office, you get scans that look at your spiritual alignments and, I guess, chakras and, and stuff like that. Even I, as a non-atheist, slightly spiritual person, I wouldn't want to live in world life because it's just overkill. It's mandatory. There's no, there's almost no meaning to it. The meaning actually has leached out of most of this stuff because it's become so commonplace and expected of people that they forgot to actually invest the original meaning they had into them. It's kind of like today, a lot of people just go through the motions with something like Christmas. But do most people know what the symbols of Christmas actually mean? I mean, beyond the basic Christian imagery, like where does the Christmas tree come from, the Christmas log, and things like that, it has become a secular celebration, which is fine, don't get me wrong. But a lot of these things don't have their original meaning imbued into them, at least by a lot of people. 
overall excellent world building. I did have some questions, as I usually do, because I tend to pick world building apart and is that kind of nitpicky bitch as I've said before but yeah very different unsettling this is not going to appeal to a lot of people I think you need to be open minded when you go into this and be prepared to need a minute <laughs> to adjust to surroundings and then theme wise at first I wasn't quite sure what to make of this novel because it goes 100% with its world building and it constructs its own internal mythology which is at times fairly opaque so you can't really access its inner core in a way but it stuck in my mind and I thought about it. Now there are definite themes in here. One of the main themes I think is agency but it's a twist on it because how do you maintain agency in a world where spiritual entities messing with humans is an actual thing? Something that can happen to you or to the people you love around you. The main character Jennifer Masden gets impregnated by the living world. You never really know what who the father is supposed to be. But she didn't choose this. In a way, she was raped by the spirits. And then she kind of realizes, or I mean, she wonders if a lot of her life events haven't been orchestrated by this living world so as to lead her to the moment where she would fall asleep, have this weird ass dream, and then become pregnant. And she even calls that force the agency and then wonders well what's left of her own agency as an individual human being and yeah that kind of messes with your head like what happens to free will when spirits are real you can believe spirits are real but i think even most spiritual people i mean most secular spiritual people will agree that there's a separation between faith and your everyday life but here miracles are not that rare you can get possessed weird stuff can happen out of the blue and it's semi-expected so what the hell do you do with your free will you're gonna start analyzing your life and like did this happen because that person actually loved me or hated me of their own agency or were their feelings manipulated by some spiritual entity so they would react this way towards me so that i would do this it would really mess with your head i think it would mess with mine and it certainly messes with jennifer Maston's. so that was an interesting way of playing around with that thought experiment i found a second theme i felt was well that of faith in general and the loss of faith perhaps so again can you even talk about faith as such when God is real? I mean, I guess you could, because faith can mean, I guess, a fair few different things to different people. But so what's interesting is Jennifer Mazin, like I said, as a kid, was really into the lives of the founders and the miraculous events that surrounded them and marked their lives. But then as an adult, after the annulment of her marriage, she kind of questions the point of going through the motions of all these rituals for every single event of everyday life. Plus she lives in what is akin to like a very stereotypical suburban neighborhood with very judgmental, fairly close-minded people who tell you you have to do this and you have to do it that way. But she's like, she doesn't want to do it anymore. So you got, for example, prayer beads. She doesn't want to take her prayer beads to a gathering for whatever festival it was in the book. And people really look at her strangely for not going through the motions. But she's like, what's the point? What's the point ultimately if this agency, this spiritual force is going to do whatever it wants, however it wants anyway? What's the point of, you know, appeasing the little garden spirits on your lawn above your bedside? What's the point? So yeah, she's definitely questioning her faith. But at the same time, you can tell she wants to believe she wants to go back to a time when all of that had actual meaning to the time of that big spiritual revolution when these founders came forward and showed to the world that this living world this world of the spirits was real present and wanted to interact in well, everyday physical life of course tied into that but it goes back to this general theme it's this differentiation or this discussion around the theme of religion or ritual versus faith but that's just what I said, like, there's a difference between institutionalized religion and rituals which are forced upon people, which become mandatory, and actual meaningful faith. Are the things you do, these motions you go through, actually imbued with meaning? Do they actually mean something? Do they connect you to the wider world, to other people, to nature, what have you? Because it's been 90 years since that big spiritual 
revolution. But now, that's something I forgot to mention, spirituality and ritual has been commodified. So at the same time, you've got these tellers, which are like prophets, and they're part of the government, because the government is no longer secular. There's a spiritual development agency or something. I can't remember its exact uh, nomenclature. But so yeah, these tellers are civil servants. So there's a whole branch of government dedicated to ensuring proper alignments of buildings and maintenance of garden totems and making sure malignant spirits don't cause too much mayhem, etc., etc. But then you've got people selling holy relics and selling plastic mini totems to make your garden grow greener. <laughs> it's been commodified to an extreme amount. It's become devoid of meaning, is the point. So there's a clear distinction in my mind between faith and a meaningful connection to the numinous and to the wider universe, whether it's physical or metaphysical, and the actual institutions of religion and ritual. And then a very small sub-theme, or perhaps, well, maybe it's actually the central theme of this novel, it's, well, the power of meaning and stories, because the prophets or priests of this religion are these tellers, and these tellers come to towns and cities. And this takes place just outside of New York in Poughkeepsie. And they go into halls, which I guess are the equivalent of churches, and they tell these grand stories, these types of parables or myths. And that's what binds the community together. And now, that might be the closest thing to magic in there, apart from like, you know, miracles and stuff. These stories are supposed to elicit, if the teller is talented enough, very strong emotion in people, even ecstatic states, and feeling like you're lifted out of your body and you connect to God for a moment. And so that's what bind people together. But you know, a lot of these tellers have themselves become devoid of that power and they become almost like rock stars and they're in it more for the celebrity than the actual sacred duty. So it goes back also to that general questioning of how does the spiritual meaning that pervades a community get lost and diluted through time because it becomes commodified and just pedestrianized in a way through uh, an excess of everyday mandatory ritual and things like that. So the power of stories. And again, you've got these myths inside there that I guess is supposed to have a meaning, but perhaps they only have meaning to the people in that society. And we can't access that meaning because we're not part of that community. And myths and stories only have meaning and power perhaps to the community to which they're bound. So it almost gets a bit meta in a way. So I don't know. Food for thought. Overall, I gave it major, major points for originality, she uniqueness. I'll repeat myself once more. I've never come across anything quite like this. It's not going to appeal to a lot of people, I feel. It's, it's very weird. And I like weird, <laughs> but this is really strange. But I respect it for really committing to its world building and just going full steam ahead with the central idea of what would society look like if you have the proof that a metaphysical reality is what well, real and how would a theocratic but theocratic based off of like animism society look like how would it evolve throughout the decades she really committed to that to, to those couple of central ideas and fleshed them out pretty well now i wasn't a super big fan of the plot like I said, not that much happens overall in the book. And the main character, while interesting, I felt lacked perhaps a central defining essence. I don't really know how to put it. So at the end, this sits between a 6 and a 7 out of 10 for me. I'm not quite sure. Originally I gave it a 6, but then I thought about it again and I was like, this is really unique. <laughs> like, this is really original. So maybe a six and a half out of ten, I don't know. If this sounds interesting, definitely pick it up. Give it a go. Like I said, the first 50 pages is a bit heavy on the info dumping. Once you get past that, you do get immersed in the world. But I guess expect more out of the theme development and the world building than the plot itself or the character development. Well, that concludes my review for Unquenchable Fire by Rachel Pollock. Hope you found the review interesting. Please do share your thoughts as usual, if you wish. And I wish you a lovely day, evening, whichever time of day you prefer. And I shall see you in the next video. Bye-bye.